In this video, we're going to be determine what is known as an empirical formula from a process known as combustion analysis. Uh, this is simply a method of determining the formula of an unknown chemical substance, and the empirical formula is the first type of formula you, that you get from this process. Let's go over some quick learning objectives that are going to happen in this video. Uh, first of all, we're going to talk about a quick review of what percent composition is all about. Uh, determining empirical formula is basically the opposite of a percent composition problem. Uh, if you have not yet watched videos on percent composition or mole conversions, please stop this video now, watch those videos, and come back to this. Once we've identified uh, what percent composition is again, uh, we'll talk about some key definitions that show up in this particular section. And then we're going to focus primarily on the process at hand, the idea of combustion analysis. We'll talk very briefly about the device used for combustion analysis. Uh, we've got a picture of one of those types of devices right here. And then we'll talk about what results combustion analysis gives us. From the results of the combustion analysis device, we're going to be able to go through a mathematical process then to determine the empirical formula of a chemical substance. And as we get through, we'll get into more details about what empirical formulas are all really about. Before we dive into some of the new ideas, again, let's talk about a quick uh, review of what percent composition is all about. Uh, basically boils down to a mass fraction from each element in a compound represented as a percentage of the total molar mass. So basically what fraction of the mass of the total mass is made up of this element versus what fraction of the total mass is made up of a second element. <clears throat> as a quick example, I believe in previous videos we calculated the percent composition of the individual elements in this substance, copper 2 sulfate. Uh, we can determine mathematically that copper 2 sulfate is 39.8% copper, 20.1% sulfur, and 40.1% oxygen. oxygen. And remember, we can figure this out simply by simply taking the mass of one particular element, for example, the copper, which is 63.546 grams per mole, divided by the total mass of the entire compound. We add up the copper, sulfur, and all the oxygens, and we get 159.6 grams per mole. We multiply this by 100 to turn it into a percentage, and that's where these numbers come from. Again, if this seems a little bit mysterious, Go back to the videos on percent composition, watch those again, come back when you feel like you're more comfortable. So let's start with some of our new content by talking about the first idea, which is the idea of combustion analysis itself. What combustion analysis is is a process that is used to identify unknown chemicals by burning them. When you burn them, we then collect the products of that combustion reaction, and we can then back calculate the formula of the compound of that originally must have existed. Really briefly, the way this works is if you recall how combustion reaction works, we start with an original chemical compound, say it's made up of multiple parts, chemical AB. When we burn it, we're going to react it with oxygen gas, and it's going to separate into its separate elements. We're going to get an oxide of chemical A, and we're going to get an oxide of chemical B. And if this substance had four or five chemicals in it, we'd get four or five different oxides. Conservation of matter then tells us that the mass of this that we create must correlate to the amount of chemical A that must have been in the original compound. Likewise, the mass of this that we were able to collect must correlate back to the mass of chemical B that was in our original compound. So we can figure out the masses of the individual elements from our compound by comparing it and using some conservation of matter ideas, this is the big key thing here, um, by comparing it to the masses of the products formed. The advantages of combustion analysis is very cheap, it is a very fast process, it is inexpensive. Unfortunately though, it is destructive, meaning we lose the sample in the process. This is a chemical change burning our substance. If the substance you're dealing with is very precious or it has some sort of value that cannot be replaced, uh, obviously combustion analysis is not the method you want to use for identifying that unknown substance. So we talked about combustion analysis from a description standpoint. Let's talk about combustion analysis instead from a visual standpoint, kind of a diagram of what a device might look like uh, and how we're able to get the actual answers we're looking for. So we can see here, uh, a combustion analysis device is really just a series of tubes and chambers that allow us to do certain things. Uh, for example, in this first chain chamber, uh, it's going to be a furnace, which means we can apply a significant amount of heat here, and this is where we're going to put our original sample. Uh, we don't know what this sample is, but we should know the elements that it's made of. Let's say, for example, this compound is made up of some number of hydrogen atoms and some number of carbon atoms, carbon and hydrogen. But we don't know what the formula is, meaning we don't know what the compound is. When we react this compound with our oxygen gas, which we provide as a source, we're going to end up getting a 
a um, oxide of carbon, which is going to come in the form of carbon dioxide, and we're going to get an oxide of hydrogen, which is going to come in the form of water. As this process happens and as this burning occurs, all of the chemical compounds that are made are going to start traveling down these tubes. This stream of oxygen gas here is going to push those chemicals down. The way we collect them then is we have what are known as traps. And that's what these canisters are here. This trap is filled, for example, with magnesium perchlorate. Magnesium perchlorate reacts selectively with the water that's created from the burning of our original sample. And as a result, all the water gets trapped here. If we take the mass of the trap before and the mass of this trap afterwards, whatever mass gained must be the mass of H2O that was generated in the chemical reaction originally from the burning of our sample. Likewise, the same thing happens over here. Now all the water has been removed, the CO2 continues traveling through the device and it enters this second trap here. In this case, this trap contains sodium hydroxide. The sodium hydroxide again reacts specifically with just the carbon dioxide and as a result, all of our CO2 gets trapped in this canister. And again, we can take the mass of the CO2, this trap before and after the process and the amount of weight that it gains during the reaction must correlate back to the amount of carbon dioxide that was originally released from our sample. And again, this mass of carbon dioxide should correlate to a mass of carbon that originally came from this sample and this mass of H2O must originally correlate back to a mass of hydrogen that originally came from this sample. We can take these mass values and ultimately use it to reverse engineer a chemical formula, We're basically figuring out what are the values of x and what are the values of y for this particular substance. Depending on the substance you're dealing with, you have to add more or fewer traps. The more complicated your sample is, the more traps are necessary. And the other catch is it does require that you know what the substance is made of. You have to know the elements present in your sample so you know which appropriate traps to attach on. There are other test methods that you can use to figure that information out, but ultimately, this is how combustion analysis works. Ultimately, what you're able to calculate from these is what are known as empirical formulas. So here's what the video is about, so we finally get to our official definition here. An empirical formula identifies the smallest whole number ratio, and this is the key word here, of atoms in your chemical compound. What an empirical formula does not tell you is the actual number of atoms. For example, we can look at the compound H2O2, and its empirical formula would simply be HO because 2 to 2 is really a 1 to 1 ratio. So the combustion analysis process is going to spit out this kind of information, empirical data information. What you're going to want to do then is translate your empirical formula ultimately into what's known as a molecular formula. And a molecular formula identifies the actual number of each atom in the compound itself. H2O2, for example, is a molecular formula that matches the empirical formula HO. The key here, though, is that your molecular formula should have the same exact ratio as the corresponding empirical formula. The empirical formula is the first stop to identify the ratio, and then the molecular formula is the actual one that represents what the compound is really made of. These two guys are definitely linked together, uh, and we'll talk about that connection a little later on. Today, we're only talking about how to calculate the empirical formula. We'll talk about the molecular formula in a separate video. So our last piece of the puzzle then is actually calculating empirical formulas. As opposed to coming up with a detailed list of things to do, I'm going to try and explain to you guys the, the philosophy or the idea behind what we're trying to accomplish, and then we'll make that idea into something more tangible by doing an example problem. So the first thing is you're going to be given percent data in the beginning of a problem. And this percent data is a ratio of the total masses in your sample. And that mass thing there is very important. So this percent data is very closely related to the masses of your samples. A chemical formula, however, is a ratio of the numbers of atoms that you're dealing with, or numbers of moles of atoms. So the process then of going from the percent data from decombustion analysis to the chemical formula is the process of converting from your mass information into a number of atom information. And that's the math that we're really going to be focusing on here. 
Now, to get into some more details here, uh, the calculations that you're going to have to happen is, is first of all, we're going to have to convert our percentages into masses. Uh, the way we're going to do this is we need to know the total mass of the sample, but the good news is since we're dealing with ratios, that actual total mass doesn't matter. I always recommend picking any total mass that you want, especially one that's convenient to work with. So, for example, if you find out that your sample is 40.1% oxygen, that means you're really dealing with 40.1 grams of oxygen from a 100 gram sample. Since we're going to use the same 100 gram sample for everything, the end result is, is what this number is doesn't really matter for us. So pick something easy. Once we get to an answer in grams, we're going to convert the masses ultimately into a certain number of moles. And if you recall from previous videos, moles corresponds very closely to a number of atoms. In fact, moles are a number of atoms. We're going to take those answers and reduce them to whole numbers, and then we're going to write that information out as a chemical formula. So this is the general idea of the process you're going to be going with. Uh, I'm going to go through an example in a minute that's going to show you how that happens, and then we'll write those steps out a little more clearly at the end of the video. So here's our example. We're going to take the same exact problem we started this video with. We already know what the answers should be, um, so it'll help us kind of see where this is all going. So here's how these problems tend to be worded. Combustion analysis reveals the following data concerning an unknown compound. Our job is to determine that compound's empirical formula. We've got to convert this percent data over here ultimately into a formula that's going to look something like this. C-U-X-S-Y-O. Z. And our job is to figure out the values of X, Y, and Z so that we have a chemical formula. The way we're going to go about doing that, we'll start with the actual numbers we were given. 39.8% copper, 20.1% sulfur, and 40.1% oxygen. Our first step is to go from percentages into grams. Again, these are ratios of one another, and as long as you multiply a ratio all by the same number, the ratio stays constant. We're going to have that same number for us be 100 grams because it's nice and easy. And as a result, the 39.8% copper is going to turn to 39.8 grams of copper. We're going to get 20.1 grams of sulfur and we're going to get 40.1 grams of oxygen as our three starting values. Now again, now we have a ratio of percentages turned into a ratio of grams. If you recall from before, we need to get to numbers of atoms, which means we want to convert from grams ultimately into a, a way of counting atoms when we're going to use moles. So we'll put in a space for our three conversions here. To convert from grams to moles, we need to know the molar masses of our three compounds. Our periodic table tells us that copper's molar mass is 63.546 grams for every one mole of copper. It tells us sulfur is 32.06 grams for every one mole of sulfur, and that oxygen is 15.9994 grams for every one mole of oxygen. You'll notice I didn't do any rounding with these and I recommend that. It makes your answers a little easier to interpret in the end. We're going to do some conversions here. Do use your calculator. We'll find out that for this we get 0 0.626. Um, our second answer ends up being 0 0.627 and our third answer ends up being 2.5. Five, zero. Now this is now a ratio in the unit of moles, which technically fits into this values for x, y, and z. But unfortunately, chemical formulas don't typically have decimal places like this. We can't have 0.6 of an atom. So we have to reduce these to whole numbers. One of the easiest ways to do that is simply by dividing all three of them by whatever the lowest value is. So we're going to divide these two guys by 0.626. We're going to divide the last one by 0.626, and when we do the math in the calculator, we'll find out that this answer ends up being 1, this answer ends up being very, very close to 1, and this answer here ends up being 3.99, which again is very, very close to 4. What this means is that the ratio of numbers of atoms means we have 1 copper atom, 1 sulfur atom, and four oxygens to get the empirical formula of CuSO4, which if you recall, matches the formula from the beginning of the, the video. If you're the kind of person that likes to see these kind of things written out in discrete steps, that's exactly what I have here. You'll notice some of the steps are grayed out. Those are ones we have not yet talked about. It'll be covered in a later video. First things first, we convert our percentages into grams, assuming a 100 gram sample, basically drop the percent sign and replace it with a G. 
We convert those answers to moles using the molar mass from our periodic table. And then last but not least, we reduce all our answers to a smallest whole number ratio by dividing by the smallest number of moles. Whichever your answer is the smallest, you divide all of them by the same thing. And then that information eventually gets transferred into a writing and empirical formula. In the next video, we'll talk about translating this empirical formula ultimately into a molecular formula, and we'll focus on how to handle these last couple steps that are grayed out. So that brings us to the end of our video. Uh, really quickly, what you should be able to do, uh, you should be able to very discreet, uh, briefly describe the combustion analysis process, a little bit about the device, uh, and a little bit about the kind of data that you get, and how that data eventually translates into what we've already talked about as being a empirical formula. You should be able to define what empirical and molecular formulas are, and most importantly, you should be very clear about the differences between the two of those. And as we talk about more molecular formula, those descriptions might be a little bit easier. Last but not least, you should be able to calculate just an empirical formula at this point from combustion analysis data. And then again, the next video is going to take that empirical formula and ev eventually get you to the point where you're writing molecular formulas as well. This process ultimately is not a very difficult mathematical process, but I find students do struggle uh, wrapping their heads around it the first couple times. We will clearly do a whole bunch more of these in class, and by the time you're done, I think you'll find that this is not nearly as challenging as it might seem at first.